Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, your host here on Keeping the World Company. And uh, we are joined by Gene Rosenfeld, uh, a retired uh, professor from UCLA, and uh, Jason uh, Olson, who is with uh, the Navy, is it, and it deals in um, you know, political issues. And so we're going to talk today about, um, about what's happening in the negotiations, if you will, um, between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia in hopes that um, Israel uh, can have a deal with them, a peace deal, and that would have a, a, an effect on what's going on in, in Gaza and lead, lead to a real peace. Um, and they are, uh, Saudi Arabia, kind of the, um, the lead investor here. And uh, I want to read a little thing that came up today in Haaretz, which is a, a, an online newspaper uh, from Israel. And this is their lead story. It says as follows. There won't be a hostage release slash ceasefire deal before Israel agrees to stop fighting in Gaza. The senior official familiar with the negotiations told the Arabs, and I guess that would be a senior official in the U.S. Saudi Arabia called on Israel to stop, quote, stop the genocidal massacres in Gaza. U.S. munitions were reportedly used in the Israeli strike that allegedly led to a deadly blaze, which killed 45 Palestinian civilians. The White House said nothing in recent incidents in Rafah would prompt the U.S. to withdraw military assistance to Israel. Further, uh, further EU member states are considering recognizing a Palestinian state, a senior EU diplomat told Haaretz. There's no indication from Israel that the Rafah border crossing will open soon to allow the delivery of aid to the Strip, uh, the Palestinian Authority's health minister said. And that's the, the lead quote from Haaretz today. So, Gene, we were hoping there would be a deal uh, that the U.S. would be involved in a, in a, in a ceasefire, a peace deal with uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, but that looks a little remote right now. Your thoughts? I think the deal is still in the hopper. That we'll hear more about that. Um, I think that the um, what present government is beginning to fray in that Benny Gantz, who joined it, to give a patina of uh, moderation to it after Netanyahu suffered all those protests even before the war, that Benny Gantz has threatened to resign on June 8th uh, unless Israel uh, negotiates a ceasefire. And uh, Israel has closed pretty much all of the crossings into Gaza. Aid is being held up. Um, Netanyahu is looking weaker, but he's determined. Uh, his government is stating that they see this war going until the end of the year. And people are beginning to react, including allies that he desperately needs. But his mindset is one of defiance and revenge. I don't know how you get past that. Jason, um, you know, you're into examining these uh, international negotiations. How do you feel about the negotiations between the U.S., ostensibly Israel, and Saudi Arabia at this point? Oh, thank you, Jay, and, and thank you, Jean. Um, I'm not uh, uh, not speaking on behalf of the United States, just uh, speaking my own personal opinion. Um, but I think that uh, I think it's very clear that the United States uh, is committed, um, no matter which which party is in power, to uh, to concluding um, Arab-Israeli. Uh, normalization and integration. So I, I don't see the United States giving up uh, in any way. I, th I think it's the, it's the United States' broader and greater interest to conclude uh, a normalization deal between uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, we're, so, some of the talks we're hearing about uh, mutual defense treaties and uh, civilian 
or civil use, uh, nuclear energy, um, other kind of defense assurances. Um, you know, th those those things have not been concluded yet, but, um, you know, having worked on uh, the U.S. Republic of Korea alliance, U.S.-Japan alliance, um, and seeing how the mechanics of those things work, um, what I can say is, uh, one, you know, one of the benefits for the United States of of uh, treaty alliances is there's a, there's a kind of a, a mutual um, constraining element, you could say. Um, so I, I think there's there's that piece that the, the U.S. is going to is going to keep working um, to try to 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 hold Saudi Arabia in its orbit. Uh, there's a lot of work on uh, China's behalf, China's uh, pushing to its west, its western flank, uh, you know, brokered the, the Saudi Iranian rapprochement. And um, so I, I think the United States is is looking for opportunities to pull in what it views as, as key uh, allies and partners it, into its, uh, you know, into its sphere, sphere of influence, as, as we say, right? Um, Israel has always been there. Uh, even though there's these, you know, the public disagreements, right? The United States is not going to side with Hamas or Hezbollah or the Houthis or Iran. They're all connected. Um, these are all organizations that are, are committed to uh, to harming the United States' interests. So it's very, so we have interests and we have politics. And from my point of view, I, I, I actually look at the two as, is separate things sometimes <laughs> and uh but i'm just talking about the united states just raw interest right now and um and i think it's important to talk about that gene what about what about politics um what where, where's the intersection in the united states and one of the elements of that uh, rs piece was that joe biden continues to support israel and that's a good thing um but he's under pressure in the united states and he's um, trying to be president and run for president again and that there are these kids on the campuses, kids and also adults, let me add, on the campuses all over the country. Um, there are members of Congress who are um, trying to um, advocate uh, that he change his policy and not support Israel. Um, so where does it play? What's the intersection of, of his policies and the politics that are happening, just as Jason raised? There is some latent opposition on the conservative side toward a uh, deal with Saudi Arabia. And maybe Jason can speak to that, too. But in terms of the fact that Saudi Arabia has gotten pretty bad press uh, with the killing of Khashoggi and uh, all of the semi-repressive things that are going on there as a society. And then you recall that during 9-11, everybody thought that Saudi Arabia was really behind Al-Qaeda when it was just the opposite, that Al-Qaeda was against Saudi Arabia primarily. But this was the mindset. And to a certain extent, there are conservatives in Congress who might object to a Saudi-American deal on that basis, not wanting the United States to link up so closely with Saudi Arabia and put it under its defense umbrella. So that's one political consideration that we just got a glimmer of this past week um, in an article that you sent around, Jay. Um, I don't think it's um, valid. I, I don't think it should prevail, but it's there. The other thing is that Biden is really on the tightrope because his left wing is pro-Palestinian. And he also, the, the Jewish vote is Democratic, and the Jewish vote, Jewish vote is not going to abandon Israel, no matter what it thinks of Netanyahu or the government, because Jews recognize that Israel is their fallback refuge. And anti-Semitism has been here for a very long time, and it's starting to show its ugly head again. So Jews are very, very upset and demoralized, and also very concerned about the Palestinian people, I might add. Um, so this deal, which was 
I think, beginning to happen before the war, and maybe one of the reasons why um, Hamas attacked Israel was to sideline this deal. This deal really represents, I think, the best possible way forward in the Middle East. One small point. Um, mm-hmm. Yesterday's paper, the Times, uh, included an article about a, a second member uh, of uh, Joe Biden's staff has quit in opposition to his policies in the Middle East, his support of Israel. That would be two already. Um, I'm, what are your thoughts about that? Just that I think people who have a modicum of empathy or a lot of empathy are going to react to the photos that they see and what they read uh, and whether it's, they, they're not going to make clear distinctions between what is valid and what is invalid. For example, the casualty rates coming out of Gaza are totally undependable. Uh, and, and it's being quoted all over the place. We're now up to 36,000 Palestinian casualties. There may be more, there may be less, but I'll bet you anything that number is not correct. One other point before we leave this uh, political realm here is that um, you know, Donald Trump has said he'll fix it if he's elected. He, he he will have a way to resolve this problem. And I don't know whether you believe that or anybody should believe that. Um, but th- <laughs> there, are, there are those who feel that um, it's believable. Uh, and there are those who feel that he will have a way to fix it and he will and he will support Israel perhaps in, in bizarre steps, but that's that's the, the implication. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? What is what what do Donald Trump's statements about Israel, about supporting Israel, uh, how do they play in all of this? The thing he says is unreliable because we've seen how he retreats and advances depending on the way the wind blows. But uh, in general, those who go to the voting booth should realize that Uh, a lot of fundamentalist Christians are in support of Israel and that fundamental, a lot of fundamentalist Christians are also in support of Trump. So he has a constituency there and his uh, policies are going to depend on what his, he feels his supporters need in order to support him. So um, I don't think that his policies will be well thought out. And I'm concerned about some of the people he may hire to carry them out. He's the kind of fellow who could create a huge war, actually, um, given his uh, style. But Jason, um, you know, Gene mentioned that the at the inception of all of this, and um, before October seventh, and I recall it, it was in the paper, is that there were negotiations actively going on um, to try to normalize things between Israel and Saudi Arabia. And there are a lot of good reasons to do that, um, and um, you know, the uh, Hamas crowd uh, wanted to disrupt that. In fact, they did disrupt that because immediately after October 7th and uh, Netanyahu's, you know, uh, attack on on, uh, Hamas, um, those negotiations were frozen. But there are a lot of good reasons for those negotiations. If you look at this from the point of view um, of Saudi Arabia, this will help them in terms of, um, you know, their position in the Middle East. And, and it will help um, uh, call it the um, the crowd against Iran and Russia. Uh, it will improve the posture of Saudi Arabia and the U.S. Can you talk about the benefits of a deal like this to Saudi Arabia? Thank you, Jay. Um, yeah, I think I think it, it's it's more in Saudi Arabia's interest to normalize with Israel uh, than, than vice versa. Especially in this moment, I think we're tempted to, you know, um, kind of pose a criticism to Israel. Israel, you got you got to you got to wrap up this war so you can normalize with Saudi Arabia. Um, from my research, just, you know, academic research and looking at the history, um, th- that's not that's not how uh, Israel has typically thought about these things. I I think that. Uh, Israel is very interested in in normalized relations with its Arab regional neighbors. Uh, but Israel also has normalized relations with with most of the countries of the world. After all, you know, it, it was invited into the United Nations in, in 1948. 
Um, and, and Israel's wary about the, the trustworthiness of, of different Arab partners. And so, you know, when you see some of Saudi Arabia's statements and, you know, just, just again, my, my personal opinion, not, not a, not a government position, uh, you know, when Saudi Arabia is accusing Israel of genocide right now, um, United States is certainly not, um, you know, to do that would, uh, upend a lot of what the U.S. military has done all in the Middle East um, and the, you know, the the some of the, um, you know, challenges the U.S. military faces. Right. To 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 because you, you can't uh, it's inappropriate to apply a double standard. So th- those are the kind of things that right the Saudis waged a war on the Houthis. Right. We could go back very uh, tactically and 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 data driven and we could well what did the saudis do the houthis did, were they more brutal less brutal than israel is to hamas right i i don't i don't have i haven't had the bandwidth to look at that question but those are the kind of questions that um right so i think the saudis would also have to prove that uh they're you know that it's worth it for israel to normalize um i think from an american perspective right we an American perspective, we certainly want Israel and the Saudis to normalize, but the Israelis uh, think of things from a different term. They, they're, they're much more local. Um, they're really the primary concern is the security in the Gaza Strip and the security in the West Bank, and that's really you know to understand Israel's point of view. That's where Israel's interests are kind of laser focused. Um, so Israel, it, it's a higher priority for Israel to not allow another October 7th to ever happen again. If if they're losing the, the capital, so to speak, for normalization with Saudi Arabia, then I think from from the Israeli point of view, it's it's a kind of a so be it. Um, now, from an American point of view, we you know, the integration of Saudi Arabia into uh, a regional economic and security framework with Israel and America's other allies and partners, especially Bahrain, uh, United Arab Emirates, um, we could, you know, we could talk about the, the complexity of Qatar. But um, you know that that benefits the United States because these are countries that have, you know, hard power, common interests with the United States in the, in the economic and security domains, and getting that that integration so that these countries are making each other more prosperous, more secure, and more uh, tied into the United States, and which keeps them away from the the Russian orbit and the Chinese orbit, right? The, the United States is frankly in a, a great power competition. So, so these are the I think the different planes of interest that are that are working right now. Um, and we we could also talk about kind of the the religious domain as well, and how the, the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Qataris. The Bahrainis. There are some actual interesting uh, on the religious variable of of why these those the um, the Abraham Accords type countries have been more interested in normalizing with Israel. There's actually there's there's really good evidence of cultural, historical, um, social reasons. A lot of it has to do with the their perspective and their orientation toward the Muslim Brotherhood. I think what what's really at play here. Um, is the way the world is dividing up. Um, And you have Russia trying to bond up with Iran. Um, You have Russia trying to be more and more influential in in the Middle East. And um, Saudi Arabia could be on the other side of that coin. It could help the United States by, um, you know, obstructing Russia's efforts to control the the Middle East. But why, why does this agreement affect that? Um, why does this agreement protect the United States interest in um, defending against the Russian takeover of the Middle East? I think both the Russians and the Chinese are are working their way into the Middle East. Uh, Russia has traditionally had a more uh, security um, connection, especially with Iran, with Syria, uh, where, where it's tried to build its its security architecture. It's uh, it, military footprint. Um, China has been more of the economic. Uh, the the Belt and Road Initiative also, you know, pushes to the west of China. Um, and there there were um, 
even a couple years ago with a Chinese investment in the Isra- Israel's port of Haifa, which caused uh, a lot of concern, um, and w- which was part of China's economic strategy and using the its state power to advance its economic interests. So I, I think that you know the United States wants to, when it has trustworthy uh, allies and partners, it wants to bring those into its orbit. Um, and, and it's trying to um, build coalitions. Uh, that, that's the U.S. way uh, all over the world. Um, I think that when we really zoom out, the, the differences in orientation have to do with uh, the complexity of the Middle East in the sense that the, the countries of the Middle East are are not so democratic. <laughs> um, so when you look at our alliances with Japan, South Korea, Australia, these are both very firmly in the United States' interest to have alliances with these countries, but also they're also de- uh, democracies. And so there's the shared democratic value, so it makes it very easy for a tight very tight U.S. alliance system, but in the Middle East, right, it, it makes it difficult. The, the you know Saudi Arabia is not a democracy. The United Arab Emirates is not a democracy. Bahrain. Um, so there are you know different points of view. Do you, should U.S. foreign policy be focused um, almost wholly on interests or uh, a little bit more on the spectrum of values? And so I think that that's kind of the. Or- the orientation toward the Middle East, which which makes it very complicated as opposed to other regions of the world um, where we you know, the United States can make alliances very easily without much political blowback. Right. So <laughs> um, you're, you're like Gene mentioned, you're getting you know, there's criticism sometimes in Congress about getting closer to Saudi Arabia. Um, but it's uh, from my pers- my opinion. I, I think, you know, the Saudi Arabia has made many decisions in the last 10 years to to orient itself toward the United States led kind of rules based order, uh, despite the fact that it's um, not democratic. So that that's that's a huge can of worms, but uh, I'll leave it there. Speaking about can of worms, Gene, part of the, um, the Haaretz piece there. That's of great concern is the reflection that um, Europe um, is um, opposed to the Israel attack on Gaza uh, and wants to, a number of countries want to have, in fact, um, um, uh, taken the position that there should be a Palestinian state. They talked about recognizing a Palestinian state, and all this is it's because of the humanitarian issues, in my view, the humanitarian issues and and the violence against the Palestinian people, and Israel's attack on Hamas. So <clears throat> how does this play? Um, because it seems to be a kind of showstop that so many countries in Europe want to recognize a Palestinian state, uh, which you know seems you know a, a strange way um, to so- try to solve the problem. Um, and the United Nations has been ineffective, and the International Court of Justice and the ICJ has been effective, ineffective. And so what we have is a, 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 a growing lack of support for Israel. This is of great concern to me and Jewish people in general, I think, and people who support Israel. Um, how does this play? Where is it going to end? What, what will it take to reverse this trend? I don't know what it'll take to reverse the trend. I mean, nothing that dramatic is going to happen with this particular government in Israel. And once a military campaign gets going, it's a juggernaut. You don't turn it around suddenly. You don't stop it suddenly. Israel's national interest is to survive. And it feels its existence is at stake. And also, it's in a tough neighborhood where it understands the culture and logic of Arab countries and the Sunni and the Shia, because most a good many Israelis lived there for maybe a thousand or more years. And they 
came to Israel because they could no longer sustain living there. Israel truly is a refuge in the neighborhood. And what Jason brought up about Israel responding to local uh, concerns is very true, and it's natural and normal. And the culture of Israel is becoming uh, akin to the culture of its neighbors. And that culture is rather militant, rather harsh, um, rather vengeful, and justice is of greater concern than compassion in, in their outlook in general. Whereas in Europe, you have a different epic completely. You have a, a, a people, uh, a set of countries that are finding unity after two of history's greatest wars that have torn them apart and destroyed them. And so they are seeking unity and peace, and they can't understand why Israel's not uh, taking their attitude and is attacking the International Court um, of Justice and the International Criminal Court, and not seeing that maintaining international law is the way to go, or you go to war. That's the attitude of countries like Ireland, Spain, and Norway. Um, Ireland uh, was fighting with Britain against the, uh, the Nazis, Spain had opted out. It was a fascist state, but it had opted out. And Norway was occupied. And Norway was the country that um, tried to get the Oslo Accords approved prior to this Arab initiative. That was, everybody was very happy. Uh, there was a great jubilant, uh, a feeling of, of jubilance around that time that the Oslo Accords were finally going to create a two state solution. And that's been walked back pretty badly, especially after the assassination of Irvine. And that's what elevated Likud and, Net Likud and Netanyahu. So the, the European attitude is not adopted by Israel at this time. It's hard to get a, a beat on exactly where Israel is. We, we hear that most Israelis uh, support Netanyahu's war. Um, but um, we, we hear that a lot of Israelis feel it's a mistake um, and a lot of Israelis are concerned about the hostages. We can never, ever forget about the hostages. They're still center stage in this in this passion play we have going on. Um, and so, um, you know, Israel has made some mistakes here. And it has, um, as a democracy, it has multiple factions, some of whom are pretty violent and retributive. Uh, what can Israel do because as long as Israel is, you know, in, in, in a, this kind of fragmentation, uh, it, it's handicapped from dealing with both Europe and Hamas. Well, I, I, I really liked what Jean was saying about the, the neighborhood. Um, you, you know, I did my, my Ph.D. at Brandeis University in Israel studies and and this was a you know a lens that we looked at a lot was the kind of the uh, Mizrahization uh, or the or maybe the Easternization of Israel. Um, initially, when Israel was created, right, the, the the elites were Ashkenazi Jews from from Europe, uh, Eastern Europe primarily. You know, you think of Ben Gurion and Ben Gurion's generation. Um, and they were bringing some of those cultural ideals and political ideals and values to that to the new state. But um, largely, Israel has uh, uh, become uh, uh, the, the Mizrahi element has become more and more dominant in Israel's politics and culture. I mean, we even see that with the, the music, uh, with the forms of dance, forms of art. Um, is, Israeli culture is is about rootedness and about uh, a Middle Easternness. Um, so if if the culture is becoming more Middle Eastern, I don't think we should be surprised that the politics are also becoming more Middle Eastern. Now that's not not to say Israel is becoming you know autocratic or something, but um, the the fundamentals of deterrence in the Middle East are are very different. Uh, than I, than other regions, um, because of you know uh, Israel's enemies are they're far more suicidal than 
than China, Russia, North Korea. I mean, these are, you know, Putin wants to stay in power. Xi Jinping wants to stay in power. Kim Jong-un wants to stay in power. But when you're talking about Iran and Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, these, they, they have a, a much more suicidal uh, way of approaching uh, military tactics and uh, national goals or, or just ideological goals. And so, so how do you deter um, enemies that are, are willing to sacrifice so much more uh, than, than other problematic players around the world? So uh, I think over time, it, it, because of Israel's neighborhood, they've, they, you know, and, and how much, you know, the Israeli elites understand about the, uh, the, the region they live and the rise of the Mizrahi population. That's, I mean, de- demographically, um you know the jews that have always been living in the middle east regionally uh have become a, a dominant force you know you see the shas party you see likud many of the voters for likud are uh, actually mizrahi or middle eastern jews um which actually undercuts this whole really ridiculous and completely uh absurd notion that the israeli palestinian conflict has anything to do with race and white versus dark or it has, it has nothing to do with that at all it's a it's a civilizational clash uh different civilizations claiming uh the same land as their heritage because really israel is becoming uh, like uh, to go back is becoming far more middle eastern both ethnically politically culturally um and, and that really bothers people they want to simplify it into a, a black lives matter uh, contest, but it, it's not, and um, to suggest so is is quite ac- anti-Semitic in my judgment. Um, Gene, it's time for us to think about solutions, and I want to put some of them on the table and see what you think about them. <clears throat> you know, one is uh, gee whiz, whether it's Netanyahu or anyone else, it seems like the attitude of the Israeli people ought to come together, <clears throat> and um, they ought to avoid. Um, um, you know, uh, visions of, uh, of, of, of of violence. They they ought to be more sympathetic. Um, they ought to, uh, um, you know, talk against the war rather than go in and and um, and do and do mean things to the Palestinians. Um, that's one possibility. I don't know if that would have any significant effect. Another possibility, which I would like you to address is um, Netanyahu. Uh, we've been talking about removing Netanyahu from power since October 7th. After all, he failed in defending, protecting Israel on October 7th. Um, that's that's the smallest problem <laughs> from him. Um, but uh, query, you know, can he be removed? And if he was removed, would that solve the problem? And finally, the two-state solution, which seems to be, to me, um, you know, a solution uh, imposed from outside without without real sensitivity to uh, what Jason was talking about. And we already have a diverse a diverse country, um, and um, I don't know if a two state solution would solve anything. Um, but query, what do you think about the possible solutions to this this Gordian knot of issues? <laughs> if we could just cut through it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they'd like to do. No, uh, I think that Netanyahu is formidable. He is one of these strongman types who really knows how to charm everyone and say the right things at the right time. He's been all over. Um, but deep down, he is an Israeli patriot. He feathers his own nest, of course, and he's got his eye on history. But he is uh, beginning to fray. He, he has to hold elections in 26. The other parties are nipping at him. Uh, I think it, it may be a slow downward spiral, but he's, he's got to get off the stage. As to whether that will make a difference, Lapid or Gantz, who are the chief people coming up, uh, nobody knows. I think they too are patriots. And everyone in Israel agrees on one thing, which is really unusual, that they would agree on one thing. And that is they have to save Israel. They have to survive no matter what. And they have a suicidal um, 
martyr oriented, uh, very recalcitrant enemy because they are indigenous people too. And you have two indigenous people fighting over the same bone. So the two state solution, I think everybody realizes is down the road. I think the Saudis recognize that too. What they want to do is try to stop the war, get the hostages back, neutralize Hamas, and find some way to provide for the Palestinian people. I think what the Palestinian people sense is that not even their Arab allies really care about where they wind up, as long as they're not a problem. And Palestinians and Israelis who have been polled recently, both are very negative about a two-state solution. Both of them, each of them wants to claim the whole, the whole thing. So there may be uh, a one-state solution, or there may be a continuation of the status quo with different people in charge of the Palestinian areas, which are in dreadful state. And there's so much rebuilding and, you know, after the war that will have to be done. Um, I don't see a fast solution. I see the big powers in the area coming together and forming some kind of an order within which the Palestinians can be considered in some way that will make this ongoing almost 80 year war and rebellion stop. I also put this question to you, but I'd like to, I'd like to add that, um, you know, Israel is fighting, um, gee, three wars. It's um, it, it's it's fighting, of course, uh, the political war inside of Israel. It's uh, fighting Hamas, which is a sort of deadly organization connected with Iran and uh, which is, um, you know, collaborating with other terrorist organizations. And, and it's fighting public opinion, um, not only in this country, which is formidable and and could have an effect on Joe Biden's policies any day um, and Europe. It's like everybody, you know, outside of Israel treats Israel as a whipping boy. And, um, you know, why don't they deal with other atrocities elsewhere? Only Israel gets it. Only Israel gets, you know, pounded on on a daily basis by the media. They sit in the King David Hotel. Where is that? In Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, wherever it is. And uh, have, a, have, a, have a, a Singapore sling and uh, all talk about what happened in Hamas. Um, and and all the press is attacking Israel. They're sitting there in Israel, attacking Israel. You couldn't do that in Gaza. You couldn't do that in most places in the Middle East. But <clears throat> what you know, what I get is there are three, at least three wars that Israel is fighting, um, and and each one could bring Israel down. Um, so my question to you is how how mm -hmm. do you defend against three wars and you know, there there is concern. I, I know I have concern, and a lot of people have concern about the these these combined threats are existential to Israel. We we assume Israel will last forever, but maybe not. Uh, I don't know how it would look if Israel didn't last forever, but I worry about. Mm, recently, there have been missiles into Tel Aviv. Um, and I and I'm very concerned that this this may increase and Israel may be under uh, existential attack. Your thoughts? Thank you, Jay. It's it's very tricky. I think the the core of it, uh, from what I see of the Israeli ethos, is that the Jewish people, like Gene said, are an indigenous people to the land, and um, I think. What this this current war is will eventually reveal to the world, to the global community, is th is that that's a fact. <laughs> I think uh, what Hamas was trying to do on October seventh was trying to what, what was it? It was really a test. Um, Hamas and many of its enablers worldwide have been deluding themselves into this concept that. The Jewish people are colonial, are colonizers, um, occupiers, um, 
just alien to the land. And so October 7th was, I think, was a Hamas's test to see, OK, if we do something so barbaric, you know, we could we could prove to the world that, uh, you know, that the Jewish people will flee from their indigenous homeland and, and just go elsewhere or or try to, you know, just try to kill all the Jewish people. I mean, that there is the, the genocidal intent in Hamas as well. But um but I think the pragmatists in Hamas, that, that's what they were trying to demonstrate. But instead, what we've seen is Israel and, and the Israeli people dig in even harder. And even, I, I mean, and uh, and yes, and uh, and experience the brutalities of, 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 heart, of very harsh war. This is this was no six day war of 1967. This is, you know, going to be a, a year long war. Who knows? Um, so we're, we're not talking about that that swift, miraculous victory, um, but it's still demonstrating to the world that the that the, the Jewish people in Israel are not going anywhere. They're they're just entrenching themselves deeper and deeper into the land. And I think that that's uh, something that people all around the world are going to have to contend with over time. <laughs> and it, and it, it actually in the long run deflates Hamas's narrative. Uh, but it, my concern is that Hamas has will lose territory and, you know, control or autonomy, a form of sovereignty over territory. And but but that's not really Hamas's mission. Hamas's mission is really against worldwide Jewish people. And, and my, my greater concern is that uh, Hamas is just going to metastasize outside of the Middle East. Um, and, you know, and that's something that you know, our policymakers and lawmakers need to be aware of is uh, we need to guard against Hamas coming to uh, in more and more in force to diaspora Jewish communities. And they, they have certainly found a foothold on many of our American and Western universities, uh, at least in the idea space, informational space. Um, but there's there, you know, we talk about in the military, the dime diplomacy information, military, economic. And if you think about Hamas's strategy and they're waging a global war on the Jewish people, think about what Hamas is doing diplomatically, informationally, militarily, economically. Um, you have to kind of zoom out and see what they're really trying to do. But that, that that's where I see things right now. And it's it's very bleak. But, you know, I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't expect to see peace anytime soon. I expect to see uh, a metastasis metastasizing of war not out of time gene can i ask you for your final comments a, a summary of your thoughts during this discussion i think we have to keep in mind that this is an 80 year old war there have been different players at different times um in terms uh, on the arab side there have been different paramilitary groups that have carried it forward but the states um have begun to fall into line over time, over that 80 year period, the state's interest is order, prosperity, and peace. You have the idea of jihadism coming into these, um, these intifada groups um, since Al Qaeda. And jihadism is a new religious movement within Islam, which is uh, very violent and very oriented toward martyrdom and tries to enlist all uh, Islamic people, all Muslims uh, into uh, a war mentality. And it, it's ongoing, it's generational. So when you're confronting something like this, um, you have states against basically a terrorist movement that is being funded by Iran and Russia. <laughs> So um, it's another battlefield on the greater global war going on right now. And I, I know I'm in the minority in saying I think we're in a third world war, but we are. And it's a new kind of war. It's on many levels, but there is a bifurcation in the world. And there is a strategy that's been very clearly expressed uh, by Russia in particular as to... Uh, how they want to bring the West down. And this is 
one huge battle in that. It's going to take a while. Jason, your your final thoughts, and may I say there's nothing so constant as change. Uh, you both <laughs> pointed out that, um, you know, this is a war that's been going on for 80 years, uh, but it has evolved. And the players, the players on the stage have evolved, increased, if you will. Everybody has a view of it. Um, everybody um, wants to weigh in on it somehow. Um, and um, it's not the same as it was. It has changed because of the the change in the players, the change in circumstances, the change in the institutions and groups involved. And so I want to frame my question um, from the Passover Seder. Why is this war or this conflict different from all the other conflicts we have had between Israel and the Arabs over the past 80 years? What makes this different? Jay, I, I I don't think there is there is that much different. <laughs> I really I really don't. I think uh, the the cause has has been constant. Um, I'll, I'll just tell tell us to tell by story. I mean, uh, my grandfather who's passed away uh, for, for a couple years now. You know, he was an American Jewish GI in World War II, and he deployed to Europe and he went to Normandy and and fought Nazis as a, he was a medic but he he still was uh, involved in combat and that was the great uh the great evil that he faced in his day and he was always proud of his service to the United States of America um and you know you know not not a perfect country in, in any sense but able to um, muster the power, the hard power to confront evil in the world, and so, uh, so this is just a, uh, this is just a, a reincarnation of of things that he saw in his day that he told me about when I was a little kid. Um, I, I'm grateful that Hamas doesn't have the the strength that Nazi Germany did, but Iran very well could. Iran is sitting on sitting on top of a uh, tremendous amount of energy and uh, Iran as a nation state could could develop that kind of power that that Nazi Germany had um, and they certainly have a very similar ideology that Nazi Germany had not and we're not saying anything is bad about Iranian people or Arab people or Palestinian people but there is a an evil ideology that must be confronted by great, hard power and i'm my call is just that that the united states that we remember our greatest generation we remember uh the kind the moral clarity of our greatest generation and we not uh, get confused and you know embrace terrorist organizations that are only committed to death and destruction um that that's that's how i look at it well thank you gene rosenfeld thank you very much for the show this discussion and uh, uh, Jason Olson, thank you very much for the show and this discussion. Aloha. Mm -hmm.